Um, and so we are here to talk about applying the concept of community development hubs, um, how to move the work we're doing towards something that is transparent. And as we get into that conversation, I mean, this really is going to be more of a conversation among the folks who were able to join us today for the webinar. But um, before we get into that conversation, I wanted to share with you a few of the concepts that Janet Topolsky shared with us just as a review um, of our last webinar that we had. And so, um, again, it was Janet Topolsky who was with the Aspen Institute, or is with the Aspen Institute, um, and they developed this report on rural development hubs or organizations that are working regionally to improve their communities um, through uh, building local economies and uh, just improving the quality of life overall. So there is the rural development hubs book that you can get, the report you can get from their website, um, which is at the link that shows up on this slide, or if you just Google it, um, Aspen Institute Rural Development Hubs. Most of the um, affiliate board members should have received a hard copy of this that we mailed out. It's been a couple months now, but, um, but you should have received that. So. so just as an overview of what Janet talked about is there are three approaches she talked about to community issues. And we find ourselves in the work that we do adapting all three of these approaches. The first is that sometimes we treat the symptoms of an issue. And she used the example of people being hungry in the community when she talked about these approaches. And so to treat the symptoms of an issue of hunger, we feed people by setting up a food pantry or a food bank. And so we make sure that we can meet their immediate needs by feeding them, which is an important thing to be able to do. But then she also talked about how we can also take an approach to cure the disease that we think is causing the issue. And in that case, she said, maybe people aren't able, they don't have workforce development, they don't have enough training to, um, uh, to be able to have jobs that, uh, to, that affords them to buy food so, um, so that they can afford to buy that food. And so an approach of curing the disease would be to provide training, workforce development, assistance to those families so that they can afford to buy food. And then the third, I'm sorry about that, move forward too quickly. The third thing that she talked about was the idea of preventing the disease. And this is where she starts really saying rural development hubs work, is they work in addressing systems type changes that need to happen. And so in communities that can actually grow their local economies so that there are an adequate supply of good jobs for those families and for people who to become breadwinners for those families, um, that really is the underlying kind of approach to um, not just treat the symptoms or cure the disease, but actually prevent people being hungry in the community in the first place. And so that's how you move towards something that is transformative, is you're transforming the system in the community so that the, the issue never arises in the first place. So that was the thing that she talked about with the three approaches of community issues. She also talked about multiple capitals in communities. And we're gonna come back to all of these in our discussion. But um, when she talked about capitals, it was the idea of growing multiple assets that contribute to the well-being of people, places, or economies. And these are the assets that she talked about. Um, there are individual assets, which are the skills, education, physical health, and mental wellness of people that live in the community. There were intellectual assets, which had to do with knowledge, resourcefulness, creativity, and innovation in the community. There were social assets, um, and I think we hear these sometimes referred to as social capital in a community, and that people have trust, relationships, and networks for things to happen in a community. She talked about natural assets, water, air, forests, and other natural amenities that exist in a community that can be used as assets. The built capitals in a community, those are our physical infrastructure things, buildings and, and that kind of infrastructure, sewer systems, broadband is a big one in today's economies and today's communities that a lot of people are thinking about, roads, um, ways to get in and out of the community. Um, political capital is another thing, and that is influence on decision makers and on, um, and on resource allocation. And many times I think people think of this solely as political capital in terms of elected officials and things, but sometimes there's political capital that exists in communities um, that may have to do with, well, an example, um, 
in Owsley County, my children's great grandmother was a woman who had enough political swing and capital in her little area to get a landowner to give a corner of their property so that there was a road where people turned off onto Main Highway 30 there and you couldn't see. And so um, she talked this, these folks who owned this field there to give up a corner of their property so they could, you know, take it angle out of the bank. And that was, in a way, that was a political and a social kind of capital that she had in that community that um, the landowner said, well, if Cliffy asked me to do it, I'll sure do it. So <laughs> that was um, that, you know, anyway, the political capital piece, I just wanted to expound on a little bit because I think it goes beyond elected officials. Um, and then there's cultural, uh, cultural capital, um, the traditions, customs, and ways of doing um, in a community. And then, of course, the one that people most readily think of that she said, you know, you can throw money into a room or throw money at anything, but people think about that, that financial capital when you think of capital in the community, and that is savings and investments. But again, in order to move towards something that is transformative, um, we need to be thinking about and addressing all of these capitals. And then she talked about um, challenges to developing capitals. And she said, here are the challenges that we have to face. First of all, it's difficult to develop these capitals sometimes as a single organization because they are big picture things. That it's difficult to do it as a single community, that these capitals cross boundaries. Um, and that's what we talk about, I think, in the next section. But you know, that a single community has to think regionally and gather with other communities to develop these capitals. Um, issues, assets, challenges, opportunities, and economies, again, cross geographic regions. They don't see county boundaries. Um, there is no government of a region many times. And so it's not like you can ask a government to think about developing. You have to create your own structures for creating a way to make decisions and to make things happen within a region. Um, and that's what partly what the community foundations are doing is that they are creating an avenue for that kind of leadership and decision making as well as building that financial capital. And then um, she said that many times the perception prevails that the answers lie outside a region rather than within it, especially in rural areas where, where they might feel like they have to often look outside for resources. And so moving towards something transformative means that um, you are overcoming these challenges. And so she defined what a rural development hub is. A rural development hub is a place rooted organization working hand in glove with people and organizations within and across a region to build inclusive wealth, increase local capacity, and create opportunities for better livelihoods, health, and well being. And so the, the result of being transformative for the population that lives there within whatever region the Rural Development Hub is serving is at the heart of what this work is. And then, um, and these, there's a lot on this slide, but the, she um, described to us what it is that sets a Rural Development Hub apart from any other kind of collective movement or organization. And so, so what she said is that Rural Development Hubs think and work region. So they work region-wide. They assemble the region for discovery and dialogue. So there's a lot of um, uh, maybe trial and error and they learn from their mistakes um, and they have they talk about the, the uh, issues that are within a region and the work that they wanna do in a region. They are of the region, they know their region and they build trust in their region. They take the long view, they bridge issues and silos. They analyze things at the systems level. And so again, they're not just thinking, they're trying to be outside silos and they're not thinking about just providing that, um, you know, the cure to the, to the disease, but actually preventing the disease. They collaborate as an essential way of doing. And so anytime that they are approaching something, they think about who else needs to be involved in this. They actually create the structures, products, and tools to foster collaboration. And again, I think Janet raised in her presentation that, you know, the community foundations, she brought several examples in about how, you know, community foundations are sometimes the structures and the tools to foster that collaboration. Um, they translate, span, and integrate action between local and national actors. And so they are tools to funnel in um, 
uh, national resources sometimes um, and national actors. They flex and they innovate to become what they need to be to get the job done. And so they are responsive to the community and to the region in which they're working. They tolerate, um, they take risk and they tolerate risk. And then they hold themselves accountable to the whole community. And so again, those are the kind of characteristics that set apart these um, rural development hubs and move them toward something transformative. And so that is what, that's a really like Reader's Digest in a nutshell version of what we uh, talked about with Janet at that last webinar that we had. And I thought what we would do now is just have a discussion among the folks here on the webinar um, about what it is that we are doing already within our community foundations um, and within the affiliates and the foundation as a whole. Um, or ideas that you have about how we can move forward as a rural development hub. And so the first discussion question is, and we'll go back to the community capitals so you all can see them again, but um, looking at the community capitals, if we pick one that is not financial capital that you think your affiliate community foundation is already working to build or could work to build, then what ideas do you have about that? And so let's just talk about those capitals and we will go back to them. Um, and so if you take a look at these capitals on your screen, um, pick one of those that's not the financial capital and can anybody share something that you're doing or that you would like to do with your affiliate foundation around one of those? You know, not necessarily from and I know we're supposed to, I guess, be talking about the affiliate foundations, but thinking about that whole collaborative regional kind of thing, I feel like that um, over in our neck of the woods that we're really kind of touching on all of these. Now, are we doing an excellent job in all of the areas? Probably not, but because um, who is always doing an excellent job? There's always room for improvement, but with respect to individual, you know, there's a lot of folks that are being lifted up in the community, they're being trained, um, they're being um, um, elevated to take on leadership roles, uh, which is really important, I think. Um, you know, we've got a bunch of smart people in our area, and there's a lot of collaborative effort that is going on to do things. Um, you know, you somewhere on one of these slides, it was talking about, you know, you have to be in it. It's the long game. Um, sometimes, you know, you get on social media and there's comments about, you know, this, that, or the other, and folks don't necessarily understand what's really happening and the inroads that are being made because it is a long game. It's not yeah. gonna change overnight and people want instantaneous, but I know, I know that there are smart folks that are working on this. Um, you know, I, I see personally um, the social part and, and the relationships that are coming together. I don't even think we have to talk about natural resources. I mean, here, just right here in our neck of the woods, we have an incredible trail system that's just been built in the last three or four years. And we're now a trail town and um, there's efforts going on on physical infrastructure and the broadband initiative. I think generally speaking, our politicians are, are right on board with us. I think we're mm -hmm. well connected with those. I think most of us have their cell phone numbers and um, you know can call them and aggravate them when needed. And they typically respond to our text. Um, I don't think you can say anything more about culture other than Appalachia. You know, as soon as you mm -hmm. say Appalachia, that speaks and talks about culture and so I, I don't know. I mean, I look at all of this. Now, my question is, and I would be, I kind of direct this question to Kathy. Um, has, is, has the foundation thought about telling this story in this way, defining itself as the, as a rural um, hub and a rural development hub and, and being able to tell the story of these aspects. I mean, this to me, I know the website and all that kind of stuff is designed, but 
you know, this is an excellent approach to talk about how the community and or the community foundation is embedded. Um, have you guys looked at that at all? Um, is there any thought about taking this concept yeah, and, and, a, and making it a part of the foundation? That's, that's exactly uh, what, what we've been talking about. And we've been talking about how that the networks of all the affiliates will work together, take the leadership role in their communities, you know, build the trust and uh, have relationships with the community members as well as the political members. Um, you know, when it gets down to, of course, you know, the customs and the tradition and the culture that I mean that that's pretty much a given um, you know the physical infrastructure maybe not as much but they could have influence in that but yes uh, I mean Jerry says you know she talks about a development hub as being the development hub all the time so I, we are trying to tell our story more centered around that that concept uh, we're doing uh, a couple of videos and we're doing some for the affiliates to put on the website. We're also doing one overall of the, uh, the foundation. We've had a couple uh, takes of it. We're, we're revising that just a bit, uh, but it's, it, it's condensed and it kind of explains how that uh, we want to meet the people where they are. We want to, to work with them, work with that network and also build, bring down capital from national funders because it'll be an easy way. I think in that video, Laura explained, she said uh, capital will flow where it flows easiest. So we want to make it easy for somebody nationally to, to send money into the area. And they know that these local boards will know what to do with it, what's needed in that area. So uh, that that's exactly kind of what the thoughts that, that are going through at the what foundation. Does that, what does that look like? Um, in a real-time logistical way for the foundation of Appalachia, Kentucky to, um, and I, I, I mean, I don't mean, um, I'm not talking uh, like top down, but I'm just going to say push out that type of initiative. I mean, is it solely through these webinars that you guys are hoping to create that synergy or, or is there a more, because I mean, look, you know, we got six people on the call. So, you know, I'm the <laughs> only person for my foundation. So I'm, I'm just wondering how do we, how do we logistical, but because, you know, when we got the booklet, I went and shared that with Dr. Linden and I uh, pushed out the high points and I think it's just an excellent concept because doing things in silos, you know, that's not been working for a long time, but um, not only should we not do things in silos, but there are better ways to do things collaboratively. And I really liked this approach. And so I did share that with her, but I'm just thinking logistically, how do we make that happen? Yeah, had she seen the book before? You know, she said that she had heard of, maybe she did, um, I know that there was a conversation about her being familiar with it. So I don't know what the familiarity was, whether or not she had gotten the book or whether or not she had seen or read something about the concept, but she did know about it. Good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, as far, I mean, I think that with the revamping of the website, with all the new materials, with the new branding, I think that is the, uh, that's the overall concept. And, and I think we just, are working on it every day as far as a timeline <laughs> you know it's well, just an ongoing yeah about a timeline I was thinking more about what does this look like to get you know I, I I'm I'm a part I'm, I'm sitting for an exam soon and for and I'm, I'm going through the study material and so there are these competencies and everything that we do related to this association um, a competency has to be listed to show how that work aligns to the efforts. Yeah. And, and I see this as, you know, there's a list of these things and, and it's almost like, okay, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, whatever our work is, it's gonna fit into one of these um, capitals. And so um, I'm just thinking, how do you make that, how do you embed that and make that a part of the culture? Because, you know, my other members that I serve with, they don't know anything about this. 
you know, they, they don't, if we went in there and said, okay, let's do something that has to do with the built capital, they're not going to know what that means. And so how are we educating folks on that? Is this the only outlet, these webinars? Well, as of right now, well, other than the strategic planning document that Donna's been working on, I think some of that has, uh, some of the affiliates have, have these capitals listed. I wish I there. had known about this when we were working yeah. on our strategic uh, um, plan, because yeah, I think that really. I would have structured it a little differently. Not to say I'm not pleased with what we've got, yeah. love what we've got, yeah. not going to change it, but this <laughs> would, how cool would it have been if every institution's strategic plan aligns to these capitals. Right. And we did do, I mean, and I think you're right about that, Melissa, as somebody who's been helping do the strategic plans, you know, and so um, what I actually provided to Janet as she got ready for this is I took that, I had put together a matrix of the strategic plans that, that kind of compared what are the areas that are common in the strategic plans among the affiliates. Um, and I think we had a webinar just before the webinar with Janet where we kind of, or at some point we had looked at all the different plans and just said, hey, here mm -hmm. are what people are doing. Remember you all presented. Mm -hmm. Here's an overview of where we are right now with plans. And um, there are, there's some alignment among the plans in the different, among the affiliates. And so the question that was coming to my mind is how does that alignment then and, and I haven't thought of it yet in aligning it with these capitals, but then how, where's the power in the alignment among the plans from the different affiliates, even though you all are in different communities, mm -hmm. for a way to align some of your work? You know, it, it's yeah, like, well, when we, we, the college has a strategic plan, okay, and then there's all kinds of other plans underneath that. There's diversity plans and strategic enrollment plans and assessment plans and just plan, 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 plan. <laughs> But what we do make sure, even all the way down to the um, individual's performance evaluations, is that everything aligns back to the presidential priorities. And of course, her presidential priorities aligns to the overarching strategic plan. So it's like, you know, if we used this as a um, kind of a litmus test, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's like making sure our work, okay, which one of these eight capitals does this idea align to? Are we supporting cultural? Are we supporting intellectual? You know, um, and that way you don't, you don't do mission creep and, and it doesn't happen where you're way off target or you're specialized or it's a personal interest or, you know, something of that fashion. I mean, I just, I see this as, a, as an opportunity to align the strategic initiatives of all of those community foundations. So here's an example. You got all, I don't know, Kathy, how many are there? How many uh, affiliates there, are there? There are eight affiliates set and 12 counties. Okay, so. so 12 so, counties and then all right. possibility of about, I don't know, five more in the next a little bit, yeah. Okay, so so let's let then let's just say seventeen counties. So if you had seventeen counties and we were all on the same page as far as these capitals, then we could put out a a, a something I don't know and say you know we are going to work on an intellectual capital. Who's in? And everybody knows what that means. Everybody understands, and then everybody can either get on board or decide that that's not something that they're interested in at this point in time. But we're not speaking the same language, and we may not all know what that means. And so to me, this is like a common ground to get all of the community foundations, um, you know, at least having at least the same language. And when we talk about wanting to do things across community foundations, to me, this is a simple way yeah. to be able to get people on board to yeah. say, okay, we're gonna do something that's gonna focus on natural capital. Well, everybody's in theory got a park or got a trail or got some type of beauty in their community that they want to enhance, but everybody knows what that means. And so then everybody could come together. So I'm just thinking oh, that this right. is a way to, um, yeah. Just to align connect. everything, yeah, well, and connect And to, them. And to yeah. easily build collaboration so that everyone is talking the same language. So. And it's probably broad, these, these capitals are broad enough that 
it still leaves enough room for each That's right. foundation to make decisions about what is the exact work that we want. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, because so, I so think, for instance, yeah, say, say natural, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we all have to build a kayaking system. Right. That means that, you know, everyone is going to do their own thing related to natural resources, mm -hmm. but yet it's a unified project. Mm -hmm. And that is an excellent way to approach a funder. And that gives still autonomy between the different community foundations and what it is they want to achieve, but it still unifies us under one idea. So um, I know that I know the, founda the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky wants us to do this. And so to me, this is the way to get everyone on the same page. Exactly. Yeah. So what about other folks? And so um, Sharika and Bobby, you guys joined a little bit late, but um, what we are talking about is we, we have just looked, these are the capitals that Janet Topolsky shared in her presentation to us about rural development hubs. And what we are doing is we're saying, are there capitals that you feel like your community foundation is addressing already that are not, we're, we're pulling out the financial capital because we all know that everybody's trying to raise money and build financial capital. But for capitals other than that, are there capitals that you see listed here that you kind of go, yeah, we're doing that right now, or we think that's something we should focus on for our community foundation? Um, I think, and, and Melissa brought this up uh, to a certain extent, I think intellectual capital is something that all the affiliates have been mm -hmm. uh, building, what, even if it's informal, um, through a lot of their programs. We bring in, you know, people who are from the foundation, we have contractors or, or just local leaders in a specific area to get advice on pro projects. And that definitely builds a connection there and, and helps mm -hmm. to build that effort. Um, so I think that is definitely one of the main ones that we, we work towards, whether formally and, and intentionally or whether just as a, a byproduct of working with other organizations. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I know having been in most recently with Floyd County working with their um, community plan, you know, they're talking about knowledge and um, resources for nonprofit organizations and for board members. That's something that they want to do as part of their work is to build out capacity around local boards and or local, sorry, local nonprofit staff and board development. And so that's definitely that intellectual piece. And other people had similar things, other community foundations had similar things in their plans as well. If we're thinking about, we're in, in Pikeville, uh, they've asked, they're gonna ask some uh, community members to come in to the next couple of meetings so that they could figure out exactly how they can partner with them. So that's building that uh, trust you know, in the intellectual capital as well. And because they don't really know, you know, where they stand, maybe how they can partner with the health department, uh, how they can partner with the school system. So that that's important to them and that that's the route they've taken. So everybody might take a different route just to achieve the, the same objective. So I, th I think that's, each board is unique, but when you look at the capitals, I think it, it just, it overlaps. I mean, I think that that's a great way to look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So I took some notes on what Melissa was saying. And I also, of course, this is all being recorded. So we will be able to come back to some of those ideas um, too. Yeah. So, well, the other thing, so we've talked a little bit about this, the capitals seem to me like they are about alignment. Um, and then the other thing that Janet talked about, um, let me back up here, oops, actually go forward. Um, what sets development hubs apart? That's more about behaviors, about the way an organization behaves, the way it runs itself, the way staff and board members are, um, you know, uh, doing their work daily. And so, um, what I want to do next is, um, and I'm going to stop sharing while I do this, um, is what we're going to do a poll and um, we're going to do them six at a time just because there was a um, limit on the number of items I could put into a poll. Um, and so what we'll do is a poll of the first six to start with and um, we'll stop sharing while we do this. 
But um, what I would like for you to do is uh, answer this poll to the best of your knowledge that my, whether you're, you think your community foundation um, is behaving in any one of these ways. And so you can select more than one. So any of these, my community foundation thinks and works as a region, assembles the region for discovery and dialogue, is of the region, knows the region, and builds trust in the region, takes the long view, bridges issues and silos, or analyzes at the systems level. So make your choices on that kind of characteristics poll or behaviors. So again, we're talking about region is not, is, is beyond our county, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> because, because we're so, not currently, right. we're not uh -huh. doing anything. Uh -huh beyond yeah. our county. Yeah. So if and you're so saying region is, you know, again, yep. we're trying to cross boundaries. Yep. We're not. I mean, okay. my answer yeah, I don't to think all the of those is no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, let's um the So the region being that specific count community that the that yeah. your specific affiliate Yes, is that what right. we're saying? Although then? if you're thinking, I mean, if you think of the entire foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, you're serving the entire region. And so maybe that's how we define region. Oh, okay. Is that it is the full region. And although if you think about the found Upper Cumberland Community <laughs> Foundation, they are thinking they multiple counties. Already. That's so what I was gonna say. That's what I'm yeah. part of, and we right. do yeah. yeah. Because I, I think as an individual county. Uh, we've even checked ourselves a few times to say, okay, now, you know, we're working on Perry County. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we've even stopped and mm -hmm. not gone outside our county lines yeah. because we consider ourselves serving that county. So I, yeah. I don't know. I think maybe we take the long view, uh, but as far as regional work, outside of Perry yeah. County? I don't think so. Because it's set up as a geographic component fund. So right. it is set so up there may for be that some specific things that are, county yeah. or so community. That, yeah. So that, <laughs> I, those are important conversations to have though, so that everybody kind of understands what is that, you know? Um, what do we mean when we say region? Shared but, which is why they, if we can time. unify under something, mm -hmm. um, then maybe we can you know, look broader and more re and more regionally. Yeah. You know, I think about like the EDA right now has has out this very huge pot of money. Um, some of those projects can be upwards of five million dollars. Now, how cool would it be if all of the affiliates were able to come together under one of those capitals and design a program and then spread out that five million dollars? Yeah, you know, yeah. That, well, the, that's what yeah. we're talking about here. But see, we're not having those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. We get together in our board meeting and we talk about what we need to be doing for Perry County. Yeah, right. Well, I'm going to go well, ahead and the foundation as a whole is looking at, at the, the Build Back Better uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One, Melissa, I, I think to a certain extent, y'all are can participating in regional programs but we within those programs we, we look at uh, uh, countywide scope like the rural accelerator initiative y'all are participating in that with Whitley County um, so that also gets into the upper Cumberland region but obviously um, the, the Perry County Community Foundation just looks at the scope of Perry County within that regional program. And you know, Bobby, we don't even think of it as a regional thing. We think of it as this is something that, you know, we need to, you know, have Susie report on each month. And, and I mean, I don't even think we've ever said, well, how's Whitley County doing it? You know, are they doing okay? Or is there any of their ideas, you know, that we need to implement? I mean, until you just said that, I even forgot Whitley County was a part of it. So you know, um, yeah, we, I, I don't know, think, thinking bigger with respect to financial resources, especially. Yeah. Uh, to help yeah and us I think carry out those capitals because it does take financial resources. So, so you're we, walking a fine line between being focused in your community and also thinking about regional impact. And um, so, and, and you've got to live in both worlds, it sounds like, because you do have a, char a charter that says we serve Perry County for your foundation 
or we serve any other specific county, Floyd County, for example. But anyway, so if you look at the, the, the poll, um, you can see, I mean, three out of four people are saying that um, they think and work as a region, they assemble um, the region for discovery, they are of the region, know the region, take the long view, bridge issues and silos. Um, nobody answered that they analyze systems at the analyze at the systems level. So I'm going to stop sharing that just to get it out of the way. And we'll do the next six characteristics in just a minute. But I think Shereka kept trying to get a word in here. And let me... uh, that, that first one, I did not get a chance to click on submit. Oh, <laughs> I was... oh I'm so sorry. OK, OK, yeah. yeah. So um, would you would you want to share? I mean, I could reopen the poll, but um, or do you yeah, if you don't mind, I can. I can go ahead and click on the things that I thought are pertinent. Yes. And to me, I am thinking about my county. I'm not such a big person to think about the region, I think. Uh -huh. I want to concentrate on my county yeah. because our county needs all it can get. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, in the, in the, um, planning process. So we're just now working on the Floyd County plan and, and had a meeting yeah. about it. And there has been a very specific effort in Floyd County for people. They're saying they want people to understand this is not just for Prestonsburg. They're, they have very specifically said we're going to make specific outreach into some outlying areas. Per Perry County did that too, actually. Yeah. When you talk, so you are, I mean, that's where you are thinking region. Yeah. Because in our county, here the county yeah. seat, a lot of the resources end up there. That's right. And I don't want to think Floyd County means only Prestonsburg. I want Martin, I want Banner, I want Dana, I want everything. But people seem to think Prestonsburg. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Prestonsburg is. I live in Banner. You know, I, I, I'm affiliated with Martin. Prestonsburg is a little too far for me. If eight miles is too far for me, how can I think about the region? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I want to make sure my own pond is nice and clean before I go to a lake. Right. There you go. <laughs> so, to speak. so then, um, let's see. I want to get to, okay. So we have a second poll that has the other six er um, areas or characteristics or behaviors. It's really more like behaviors. Um, on it. And so I'm going to launch that poll. And so if you'll answer these, then does your community foundation collaborate as an essential way of doing? Meaning, do you reach out to others and engage them, I guess, in your work? Does your community foundation create structures, products, tools for collaboration? Do you translate, span, and integrate action between local and national actors is what the rest of that is if you can't see the whole statement so that is translates spans and integrates action between local and national actors flexes and innovates to become what we need to be takes and tolerates risk or holds itself accountable to the whole community so i'll give everybody a chance to answer those Is there anybody who needs more time? Okay, then I'm gonna end the poll and share the results on these. And so um, five out of five, 100% of people say you collaborate as an essential way of doing. Um, four out of five, you create structures, products, and tools for collaboration. Three out of five, you translate, span, and integrate action between local and national actors. Um, five out of five, you flex and innovate to become what you need to be. Uh, three out of five, you take and tolerate risks. And five out of five, you hold yourself accountable to the whole community. So what observations are there around that when we think about being that rural development hub? And With respect to our strategic plan uh, at the Community Foundation, we even said, I think in like our little mission vision statement 
that we were kind of going to uh, uh, align our work to to other efforts that were going on in the community. So I think in our conversations, we were specifically thinking about, um, you know, the city had created a strategic plan. There was some other work that happened um, that Robert uh, uh, Donnan was working with. And um, again, not reinventing the wheel. And if, if there are other plans in place and other initiatives that are going on, it just made more sense it's almost like a doubling your money kind of thing is that we wanted to join in on other efforts. Now, I can't speak to national, but um, I do feel like that we were trying to uh, join in on local, other local efforts. Okay. What about this notion of um, taking and tolerating risk? It was one of the lower end answers. I think that's another one uh, that requires the difficulty of balancing that fine line because as a, a nonprofit, obviously we have to be risk averse and you know ensure that we're not risking the donations of, of people that donate to our different community foundations. Um, but also, uh, little growth happens without a certain amount of risk. So I think that's definitely a fine line. Yeah, I think every time that we make a sizable donation within our community foundation, now there's some main, there's some mainstay players that, you know, but there have been times where we have reached out and given money. I can remember one particular time that was kind of almost a life-saving opportunity for organization. Mm -hmm. We were basically giving them money. Um, it was like emergency funds. You know, that's mm -hmm. a risk because what if that institution went ahead and, and closed up shop two or three weeks after we made that donation? Well, maybe that wasn't being a good steward. Um, you know, there's also other times there's new organizations that come around and Sometimes we provide them with seed money. We, you know, we don't really know at that moment whether or not that's going to be a viable organization or they're going to continue or they're going to thrive or they'll even do the right stuff with the money. You know, the very first time you give someone money, you hope that they're going to use the money the way it was intended, but they might not, you know. Now, again, these long-term players, you know, you, you got a relationship with them, you know. Um, but I think that just being a granting agency, so to speak, um, you know, we, we do take a lot of risk and maybe, maybe we just don't think of it like that. But I think that there is risk associated with probably 70% of the donations that we give. I'm talking about now numbers of donations, not quantity. Yeah. You know, there's well, probably can... risk with all of those. I didn't really think about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. So there, I mean, once when you give out that grant, you're taking a risk that the that the charitable cause will be fulfilled, um, and they're not going to do something off the wall that's yeah. going to shed and, a bad light on it. And you know, that's when when the donor gives something, and if we as a foundation fulfill their wish. That's one more reason for them to donate to us again and again and again. I went, to, you know, I went to a party on Sunday. Three people out of 40 came and told me that I have donated this X amount here and here. The board members don't even meet. They are not doing anything with my money. So I said, well, I have a place where you can <laughs> There you go. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, three out of 40 came up to me and said that. <laughs> and they had no clue that I'm on any particular board. But then I just, you know, I said, why not? You know, I blew, I blew my bugle <laughs> about flight. And Sir, and Sarika, you told them to give to the Perry County Community Foundation, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'm not such a big person. I'm a small-minded person. <laughs> I don't even think about presents, but I think about Banner. I think about Dana. I think about Martin. Because people tend to think Floyd County is presents work. That is not it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to look at the whole county. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I mean, we do our due diligence before we make the grants, but there's always that risk yeah. that they might not do what they're supposed well, to do with the money. And, you know, what about a situation where the risk is not a bad thing, where you kind of go, here's an innovative idea that nobody else is going to fund, and this could really make some sort of a very significant change that nobody else has thought of. And so, you know, it seems to me that you all are in a position to be able to make those kinds of potential investments in your community, too. Um, I can't think of a specific example right now, but, you know, um, yeah, there could be. I think anytime we do an event as far as fundraising or, mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying to promote our foundation, you're taking a risk because yeah. you're counting on getting sponsorships, you're counting not having to pay anything to do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You're expecting to make money. Um, and, you know, especially right now with the climate we're in, you know, you're taking a risk. Can people show up, you know, because yeah. of COVID? Is something going to change? How far out can we plan? Um, yes. so. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is true. So... So all we have to do yeah. is we have to prove it to our donors that we mean well. Of course, there are things sometimes it can be a hit or miss. I'm sure these people will understand that. But if we put a right foot forward and do our best, no donor is going to not notice that. And I think that's where the trustworthiness comes in. You build the, the trust. They know that the board is going to do what the donor intent uh, when they make the donation. So I think that's yeah. the trust. And, and uh, also they, they uh, see it in the paper. Or you talk to them, you tell them, you send them a follow-up letter, thank you, explaining you know, how, it was, how it was utilized. So I think that's a big part of the trust. Yeah. Well, and then we had an organization that we did not... Um, that we had given money to and they had come back and asked us for more money and uh, we were concerned. And so we actually did not give them money at that time. Then some changes were made and they repositioned themselves and they came back and we gave them um, you know, a significant donation. And so I think that um, you, you mentioned trust uh, I think that and somebody else mentioned due diligence, but being able to, um, you know, we could have taken a risk and we could have given that those folks money when we were concerned, but I don't think that that would have been the best time. And when we did give them money, it was still, you know, not on solid footing, but it was so much better than what it was. And so I think that it is a case by case kind of, of situation, but I think that we ultimately took a risk, but even we had to get a little bit more comfortable with the, with the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think the, the grantees have to be accountable to the, to the community foundation, and then the community foundation has to be accountable to the donor. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, that's the way we, we view that, because with, without that, then, uh, and the public. We would have donors. Yes, yeah. and um, the public. And the public. I think yes. that's just as important. Yes. And that's when are we telling our message? Are we telling our yeah. story? Right. And that's what I pulled this um, kind of um, definition of a rural development hub um, up again, because I think if we look at, let's look at this from the perspective of a donor. And if you said this to a donor, how do you think that donor would feel? Um, or... I think they would they they would feel very good about it, mm -hmm. but if I were a donor, I would say, show me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there has to be meat behind what this is, mm -hmm. and so once again, can we support this statement with story testimonials? Um, you know, a, a new building, a new playground. I mean, can, can we support this? Can we, can we explain this rather than just making this statement? So mm -hmm. I think it's important to be able to make this statement, but I think it's even more important to be able to back it up and prove it. Mm -hmm. 
And then if you look at this statement from a perspective of a, um, of a grantee, somebody who's gonna ask you for money, what do you think they're gonna think about this statement? First thing that comes to my mind is they're gonna think that it's very broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually they, grantees don't like broad, they like specifics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to figure out if they fit in there. <laughs> yep, that's, yeah, I think, and so, and how they fit in there and how they can make their work speak to this, maybe. Um, but if it is too broad for them to understand how they fit in there, Emily, that could be a challenge for them. Well, it just, sometimes, like, when it's broad like that, they can twist it so that they mm -hmm. can fit in. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, yeah, and it's the about, right people could be, you know, yeah. concerning. So I think what, for me, what this statement does is it does open an opportunity for your grantees to feel like, okay, we are part of that rural, we are part of that rural development hub. We are part of that. And they may not call it that, but they may be able to see themselves as part of a, a broader movement across the community, you know, to understand how, what it is they're asking for money for moves towards something transformative if you know and it um it's an it i think that even you know is a stretch in an education process because there many times these nonprofits are so focused on just doing well what they do and it's so necessary and needed that it's hard for them to like get out of the tunnel vision and pull up and see the big picture sometimes maybe so maybe there's a role for the um you know, for the affiliates and for the foundation to help nonprofits recognize where they fit into the hub and into the. And I was thinking of Grand Tour. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's oh, usually how we fall. So I'm like, it's not yeah. good to throw people. So for grantee, yeah, it'd be really good because yeah, it falls in uh -huh. so many different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, it's fine. It's okay. But anyway, I just thought you know to think about that statement might be um, kind of helpful. Anybody else got just thoughts about? about this as the overall kind of notion or statement of. Or just any thoughts in general, we're getting close to one o'clock and I wanted to share with you all what the next um, webinar will be about uh, before we leave, but, but any other thoughts I will. So um, I'll talk about something that I'm working on and I was thinking that the foundation could be a part of or if they want to be a part of mm -hmm. is right now I'm running the Kentucky Employer Resource Network and uh, what we do is we sell memberships and shares of a success coach to a business and then that success coach is on site and available virtually as well to all employees and we collect we do case management, of course, and collect data on why employees are coming to us. And the main objective is to help employees stay employed as well as grow within the employer. And um, so it's basically social services that we're doing in the workplace. And um, the data that we're tracking um, has basically been showing you know what rule I mean and it's I mean, we're all across the state but the same issues that rural counties that we're focused on are seeing transportation needs you know even in you know these large cities where we think why would they have a transportation need they have a bus system they have taxis they have ubers they still have those transportation needs there's still those child care needs um still clothing needs uh one of the companies that uh I just had a meeting with this morning, Highlands Diversified Solutions there in London. Um, their biggest request need from their employees was clothing, just getting work clothes to wear. Um, and so there's other ERNs, it's a na national wide, and um, we have an ERN USA that we're licensed through. And so we can, you know, see other states and regions, what they're um, doing as well. And we partner with them. We do peer learning calls, conferences, networking, all of that. And um, 
the Michigan one is where it was started in 2007 um, when all of the car industries were crashing. HR directors actually came together and developed this program um, as a shared success coach. And uh, they've worked with other foundations as far as how can we deliver what the employee, the person needs to either get employed or stay employed. And I know with Kentucky, especially um, in our you know, rural regions, that is an issue. You know, Is it because they don't have the transportation? Why is it that they don't have the transportation? Is it just financial? Is it because you know, they have DUIs? then they can't have a license, you know, and getting all to those root issues and how we can make their lives better and able to work and how we can just best serve the state. And then we also work uh, with our partners. So our strategic partners right now um, is the Kentucky Chamber and SCED. Um, and I'd like for the foundation to be a strategic partner on how we can then take all of this information and then ask for changes within these businesses, working with them on their culture. Um, we also work with, uh, you know, the state as far as apprenticeship programs, how we can make those more. Um, I'm working with one uh, city right now on starting the apprenticeship program in high school, high school, the track apprenticeship program. So then we're feeding into, you know, the regular apprenticeship program once they get out of high school. Um, and how do we create, you know, breaking this cycle of generational poverty um, and giving everyone that purposeful life, you know, having employment, making what you're passionate about your work. Um, and we've discovered and know with the Kentucky, the Kentucky Chamber's um, report, if you saw that over hiring people in recovery, the one thing that creates a successful um, recovery outlet for someone is having that meaningful life purpose, which is work. Um, and how do we help, you know, create that, whether it be just cultural change within the company, policy change within the state, um, and things of that nature. So that shifting is a, a, you know, to the life's purpose piece is that prevention piece. People have that life purpose piece and um, it, it prevents some of those issues that cause them not to be able to work otherwise. So thank you for sharing that, Emily. Um, all right, so we're about ready to hop off because it's 101, but I wanted to real quickly, I'll just share my screen again one more time, um, share with you what we're gonna, we're gonna go back to support sort of a technical leadership skill. We've been talking about adaptive stuff, kind of big picture stuff for the last couple of webinars. But um, our next webinar is gonna be led by Jenny Ann Blackson, um, and she's gonna talk about board fiduciary responsibilities and fiscal responsibilities. And so it's gonna answer questions, things, things like, what is your legal fiduciary responsibility as a nonprofit board member? What are board member roles in financial management and what falls under the purview of staff for financial management? Um, how should boards manage audits and other financial processes? And then any other questions that you all have, you can ask her when she comes to do this webinar. Um, and I realized, you know, that um, some of the, the at the local community level, your board members are serving often in an advisory capacity. But if you're on the board of other nonprofit organizations, then this could still be helpful information for you all in that capacity. Um, and just to understand how, you know, how those uh, nonprofit boards work and what it means financially and fiduciarily fiscally when you join a board. So that's what our next webinar will focus on at noon on the 27th of October. So hope you can join us. Oh, and Kathy, I'll put a message for you in the chat, uh, Kathy, um, because I think that this right here would be a very interesting uh, webinar for new board members. Not that I don't, I don't know everything either, but I think that certainly new folks and, and on our board, we have three new members and I don't know whether they're getting these notices or not. So I just um, asked the question. The ones I know, uh, I think Jackson County, I think I sent that to Donna, Keith, a few of them. So if they're, if they're brand new board members, I don't know if Bobby sent that information to Donna yet, but we sure can if you have that, yep. if you have, if you just send it back. Bob, um, we'll make sure them. they get on. He does. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 I'll, they just I'll be sure to this month. 
I'll double check to make sure they're on the list. But yeah, yeah. They and I'll be, be sure to them. add them to my list too. Then yeah. sometimes the ones that have rolled off, they may still be getting them, <laughs> but we want to make yeah. sure we have the new ones. That happens. <laughs> that happens. So, we didn't have anybody roll off. off. We just added three new folks. So okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was good great, Donna. Thank everybody you. Everybody have a great have a great Let's day. Think about. All right. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>